Colin McGrath has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask the supplementary question, that they should rise in their places continually. The member who has asked the original question will be afforded an opportunity to ask the first supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Health, given the recent change of management personnel in the organisation and the resignation of all of the non-executive directors, for his assessment of the capacity of the Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority to undertake its work and fulfil its statutory duty in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. I call the Minister for Health. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And with your indulgence, could I ask for an extra minute in regards to the, to the answer? The changes to RQIA's management personnel and board membership will have no impact on the day-to-day -day work of the RQIA, and I am confident of that. And let me be make it clear, I continue to have to total confidence of the staff that work within the organisation. I am grateful to those staff for their continued commitment to delivering on RQIA's priorities, because this has been an unprecedented time, and the RQIA staff have worked tirelessly and consistently with colleagues across the HSC as an integral part of the regional response to support services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Following receipt of a request from the Department and in response to an urgent need for support across the HSC, the RQIA significantly reduced its inspection activity and review programme. This temporary measure was introduced on to understandably minimise the risk to of health and social care professionals and other visitors spreading infection within care homes. I would remind the House that similar decisions were also taken in England, Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland. The resignation of the board members is regrettable, especially coming at this incredibly challenging time. That is why, within hours of the former board members resigning, I move quickly to appoint Christine Collins, MBE, as the new interim chair. And I am confident that Christine will further strengthen the voice of people who use the health and social care system, something that I am personally very keen to see. And as I said last week, I have also asked officials to consider how, going forward, we might further strengthen the voice of people who use services in the field of regulation, quality and improvement, in keeping with our approach to co-production and partnership working. In light of the move to rebuild HSC services across Northern Ireland and with community transmission of COVID-19 now significantly reduced, the Chief Medical Officer has written to RQIA seeking to enable it to increase its activity across all areas of work. RQIA has developed a revised flexible inspection process which it intends to implement from July 2020 following engagement with providers and trusts. I am confident that RQIA will continue to take a pragmatic and flexible approach to how and when inspections take place and endeavour to meet the statutory minimum requirements where possible. In the immediate time, it is important that RQIA focus its activity where it is most needed and following an assessment of all the risks. I have today asked David Nicholl of Onboard Training to undertake a review of the circumstances that gave rise to the recent events in RQIA. David has a wealth of experience in this area and is a highly respected independent figure, and I look forward to receiving his objective analysis of the position. I call Colin McGrath for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for coming today to address this um, urgent matter. Uh, and I thank him too for his response to my urgent question, which has at its core the protection of our vulnerable and elderly relatives. Um, it would appear, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the management of RQIA was systematically dismantled in the middle of a global pandemic without the consent of its board. Was this the sensible thing to do, given that our care home sector is on the front line of this pandemic? And who took these decisions, and do you uh, stand over them? And I thank the member for, for bringing this matter to the House, because I think it is something that needed addressed, just not publicly, but also in, in this chamber as well. In regards to, to the management changes that we made in the teeth of the COVID-19 pandemic, and members should always remember that these were only a few months ago when we were looking at scenes across Western Europe and in Italy, where people were lying on, on hospital corridors waiting on treatment. And changes for, for management, the RQIA's chief executive, Olive McLeod, has actually temporarily taken up a post within the public health agency, which is also another frontline um, part of our fight against COVID-19. Uh, Dermot Parsons, who is now acting, was the previous director of Assurance, 
and has been appointed as the interim chief executive of RQIA. And Emer Hopkins, previously the Dep deputy director, has taken up post as interim director of improvement. So it's not a completely new management team. We took all of out to, to place her in PHA at a time when we needed to, to strengthen what PHA was doing in regards to, to test trace and our entire system there. And we used her expertise. Uh, Dermot and Emer were then promoted internally to retain uh, the collective knowledge and management experience within RQIA. Now call Colin Gildenew. Thank you, Minister. Um, given the en masse resignation of the board uh, and the quite unprecedented nature of that, does the Minister accept that the Department's actions have called into question the independence of RQIA? Uh, I, I don't think it does. Um, I, I think there are difficulties in relationships that the independent inquiry that have asked David Nicholl uh, to take forward, maybe tease out. I was made aware of tensions between uh, the board and the executive management of, of RQIA uh, at the start while we were actually working through our response to the pandemic. So th those tensions, I think, will be teased out and worked out. But in regards to, to the independence of RQIA, I don't think that has been affected at all. And I think their reaction and how now that we've actually stood up inspections again as from yesterday, we'll actually strengthen that input as to how we manage the care home sector in the next few months and make sure it's prepared for any second surge should that occur. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the uh, Minister for the opportunity to answer some questions on the subject. With hindsight, does the Minister accept that the Department focus on minimising the risk of health and social care professionals from RQI spreading infection within care homes was disproportionate, uh, given the rapid spread of the virus in these homes at the height of the first wave? Um, in regard to that point, and I think, as I, I, I said in the earlier statement as well, the steps that were taken in regards to repurposing the, the RQIA, or that quality inspectorate, um, was the same steps that were taken in, in England, Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland. It wasn't about stopping inspection, it wasn't about stepping that back, it was about a reduced inspection process, but it was also about utilising the professional uh, talents and capacity that we have of those people working within RQIA, from, from social care workers, from nurses, um, from healthcare professionals that we can actually put in place to support care homes in regards to infection control, the use of PPE, and how they actually supported the residents as well. So it was about repurposing a, a cohort of very um, high qualified and reliable staff who knew the sector to actually aid us in the response uh, and how we tackled uh, uh, COVID-19. I call Sinead Brandley. Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, given that there is a critical need for a regulatory body at this time, can you outline how long you anticipate a new board coming together to take? And have you any interim measures in plan that could perhaps bridge the gap between a full board being put in place? Um, again, I thank the member. And again, that, that's a critical point. And as I said, that's why I moved it to to appoint Christine Collins, who's the current chair of a place and client council. So someone that comes with experience of not just the health sector, but also chairing a board. Um, to, to clarify the point, I wrote to the Commissioner for Public Appointments on Thursday the 18th of June to inform her that on the 17th and 18th of June, the active non-executive chair and five non-elective board members had resigned. So I've already engaged with the Commissioner of, of Public Appointments. That process will now start, and I hope to have a full board in place by the end of July. I call Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And may I thank the Minister for his response so far, and may I also thank him for his swift response in setting up the independent investigation into the RQI. However, uh, can the Minister ensure that the terms of reference in the investigation cover why the recent board of the RQI didn't action the many recommendations from previous in investigative reports, and particularly those from the Care Inspectorate and also from those for the Commissioner of Older People? I thank the member for his question. I, I think when, when looking at the terms of rest, reference of what I'm going to ask David Nicholl to do, I'd rather concentrate on the, on the specific at this minute in time. I'm aware that the, the Commissioner for Older People has raised a number of concerns in regards to outstanding pieces of work that the RQIA were undertaking and are due to undertake, but I think in the initial steps, um, I'd be asking David to look at the, this specific focus because I can't afford to detract or distract the current staff within RQIA as we move 
back into the inspection phase that they, they are tasked to do and they're, they're empowered to do. I call Paula Bradshaw. Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, given um, your press statement over the last 24 hours, you said that you wish that the board members had have approached you and raised the issues so you could resolve them. And now, now we know that emails were coming forward from the former chair and the interim chief executive to your chief medical officer and permanent secretary as far back as the end of April. When did you become aware and what have you done in that, in that time period to try and resolve the issues? Um, I, I thank the member for her point. I, I was made aware uh, in early May that there were tensions between the executive and the board of RQA. I wasn't aware that it was to the extent uh, that it is. Neither do I think uh, is the chief medical officer or the permanent secretary within the department. So when the resignations did come through, they did come as a surprise because I was actually due that afternoon to meet with the chairs of all the arm's length bodies, including that of the RQIA chair as well. So she resigned on the morning that I was actually due to meet him, so, or meet her, apologies. Um, so that engagement was, was actually in the diary and ready to happen, but unfortunately, um, events overtook that engagement being made possible. I call Alex Easton. Yes. Could I uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far? Can the Minister give um, us a guarantee that the RQIA will be able to uh, function properly as a result of these resignations? Uh, I can, um, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, because I think it's made it clear um, in, in my statement earlier on. Um, the staff of the RQIA are still doing the functions that they're meant to do. They're still doing that very well as a group of highly professional individuals who, who are tasked with the regulatory inspection side of our care homes and our health system. So I, I'm confident that they will be able to perform the tasks that are, are part of their duty and role. But I'm also, in, 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 I suppose, reassured that that oversight function is, well, is there as well, with the appointment of Christine Collins as the interim chair uh, of the board until we get a full board in place. I call Pat Sheehan. I'll ask John Corla, August Gombegas Lechenara, as Dr. Regis, thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, and given the fact uh, that there have been a serious number of scandals in our care sector over the past number of years, particularly in the Murray Manor and in Ashbrook, and the fact that so many uh, residents in, in the care sector have died during this pandemic, what is the Minister going to do? to ensure that there's a proper regulatory authority there in the time ahead. You know, I, I think the, the member does, does make a valid point, and it's something I've also raised um, in previous statements. I do think we need a written branch review of what our RQIA and the body actually does. I think we have restricted them in the legislation of the inspections that they could carry out, and there's an expectation that those inspectors with RQIA actually look at more or should look at more than they do. And that's why I think it's also important in, the, in the, the appointment of Christine Collins coming from the Patient Client Council. And in my statement as well that I referred, I think it's crucial that in the appointment of the next board that we do make sure there's people on that board that have the lived experience, that have the patient input as well, so that the board reflects wider society and those who actually rely on RQIA carrying out its inspections. I call Joanne Bunning. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, through you, I would ask the Minister, in light of the high-profile resignations on the board, what immediate steps will he take to ensure both community and public confidence in the work of RQIA at this critical time for safety, support and care of those living and working in our residential care homes? Thank you. Um, and, and I thank the Member, because it is a very important point that she does make. And I would ask you know, all those who have loved ones in care homes have been through a very trying time over the past 14 weeks when we haven't, you know, we haven't enabled them to have visiting access or been able to get in and see their loved ones. There is a reliance on the staff of the care homes and those, those inspectors and inspectors from RQIA who will now be, be engaging again with the care home facilities to make sure that that reliance and reassurance actually is there. But in regards to, to the reassurance, I think I've said in my statement, um, the appointment again of the interim chair that we have with her exp experience coming from the patient client council, I hope there was more of a merger of a thought process and, a, and a, I suppose a synergy of the two organisations that can actually increase the patient voice and input into what RQIA actually does. I call Alan Chambers. 
Speaker. Uh, Minister, uh, given the fact that similar decisions have been taken across the United Kingdom, does the Minister consider that the operational decision reducing the number of routine inspections of care homes in March, designed to reduce disruption of routines within homes and to curtail the introduction of the virus into care homes, and also the decision to redeploy staff involved to other more pressing duties around the pandemic was justified and the appropriate thing to do in the circumstances at that time? Again, I refer the member, I think, to, to a previous answer when I, when I said actually within the staff of the RQIA being redeployed and repurposed to actually support um, the care home sector and the residents and provide their professional uh, guys, should it be social workers, should have been the nurses or even the pharmacists who were part of the RQI inspection team, enable them to actually get into homes as part of the physical um, support that we were given to care home workers and the management, also the residents in there as well. But I think, as I referred also in the statement as well, and the member will be, be aware of, what we did at that point in time in March was in the teeth of the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, it's where we were seeing it spread across not just the United Kingdom, but but Western Europe, if not the world, and the decision that was taken uh, at that time was the same as the decision that was taken in England, Scotland, Wales, and the Republic of Ireland. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for bringing this urgent oral question here today. The Commissioner for Older People has rightly described the resignations of the board as a very worrying development, and this morning he said the circumstances surrounding the resignation as a mess, and that this couldn't have come at a worse time. So I'd like to ask the minister, minister if he agrees that independence is vital to provide proper scrutiny, whether the department undermined the RQIA's independence, and whether he thinks that RQIA should be given greater, greater statutory independence in order to better fulfil its functions. And again, I, I thank the member for her, for her comment, and also noticed that the, older people for, or the Commissioner for Older People actually said this morning that a new board must grasp the reform needed as a matter of urgency to ensure we get a system of regulation improvement that tackles the underperformance of providers swiftly and robustly so that older people are better protected now and in the future. So I'd fully concur with what um, Eddie Lynch said this morning because that's the same direction of travel that I'm going in uh, as Minister. So in regards to the independence of, of the RQIA as an inspector, I'm keen that we reinforce that. It's already there in legislation, but it's also about bringing, uh, as I said earlier, the patient user experience into that inspection and quality process as well, because I think that maybe has uh, been missing in the past. And when you when you engage with some of the families, and I think you know there was previous reports uh, that Mr. Sheehan uh, referred to earlier on. I think when you look at the the out findings and outworkings of a lot of those, the feedback is there was there was a lack of family and user input. So I, I hope when we reconstitute a new board, and I intend that when we reconstitute a new vo board, that those voices are actually there, not just to provide an independence, but also an insight of, of that lived experience. I call Jim Allister. Why, knowing he was coming to this House this afternoon, why did the Minister choose to announce the investigation by Mr Nicol at a press conference rather than to this House, given what some previous speaker rulings have said about the importance of ministers giving this House its place. And could I ask him, when the board members resigned, they said they had done so because of decisions taken by the department into which they were given no input. Is that correct? And if so, does that suggest a degree of overbearance and interference from the Department, which calls into question the perceived independence of the regulator. Um, and I thank the member, and I can assure him there is no disrespect meant to either the members of this House or, or anybody in it in regards to, to the announcement um, of the inquiry. Um, every Tuesday over the past two to three months, I have done the executive press conference. I was asked today in regards, and I made the statement in regards uh, to what was going to become in regards to, to appointing David Nicol to, to complete the inquiry. It was the press conference. This, this issue has received much press coverage um, this morning. There are many members in this House who have made many statements 
uh, in regards to what they were going to say and what they were going to tell me today when I came to this house. Uh, so when a member of the press asked me in response and in my statement, I made it. So I, make, um, I, I will apologise to the House for doing that in regards to timing, because I'm here today for this urgent oral. I'm also up shortly in regards to a mental health debate as well, so timing did not allow me, uh, Mr Allister, to do anything different. But, and he knows I have great respect for this House and the members in it. In regards to the timing of the decisions that were taken and, and the repurposing um, of the RQIA and the inspectorate. It was a direction that came from my department so that we were able to repurpose those members of staff within RQIA to make sure that we were reacting in a prompt, accurate uh, way to make sure that we could support uh, those people in care homes who actually needed it. And that's what we did by reducing the number of inspections uh, that RQIA was, taken, uh, was able to take place as because it has actually mandated in legislation how many inspections they are meant to carry out per year. So it did require a change in legislation as well, which my department was mandated to do to allow them to actually facilitate this, this operation. I call Jerry Carl. Member for uh, submitting this urgent oral question. Minister, does the resignation of the entire board of RQA who oversees the handling of care homes not re represent a damning indictment of your and previous minister's approach to the handling of, of care homes? Um, I, I think in regards to, to the support that we, I have given to care homes uh, since taking up this post on the 11th of January, I think has been expressed and demonstrated in regards to the financial support, the repurposing of staff and trust staff, not just RQIA, to actually go in and support the care homes. And the member will, will, will well know through my, our interactions with the committee how I see and how I prioritise our care sector in regards to its place within the health and social care family, because I do value it. I think you know, at one of the engagements that we had at the health committee, I referred to it as the Cinderella service of our health care profession, as one that has long gone unrecognised and unrewarded. It is something that I, as Minister, want to change and bring forward recommendations to the executive as to how we further support our care sector and that, that the people who work in it, who are often working at minimum wage, if, if sometimes not even below the way they are their hours are actually working. So it, it's, it's, my, it's, my, it's my aim to make sure that those people who are working in that sector are valued and recognised. I call Mervyn's story. The Deputy Principal Speaker, and I thank the Minister for coming to the House. And I think his last comment uh, may be a personal comment in relation to how uh, care homes are valued in society. I do wonder uh, if whether or not that goes right across uh, the higher echelons of the Department. Uh, and particularly as we look at any reorganised inspection regime, can the Minister provide uh, an assurance that the resumption of the statutory and non statutory inspections will be carried out in a safe, coordinated, and care centred way and it will be done in a timely manner? Because it is extremely sad that, yet again, in the midst of uh, these circumstances, care homes are at the centre of this story. And I know your personal uh, concern about that, but this is an issue whereby we need clarity around what the department knew and what the department did or didn't do. Uh, member for, for, for raising that point, because as minister, this is a personal issue. And that's, uh, that's as I feel as every minister should bring to their portfolio. Is, is how they understand and how they want to support those working in it and those who rely on it. In regards to, to the support of, of the department, what it knew, when it knew and how, how it reacted, I intend and I fully intend to empower David Nicholl to bring all that to the fore so it will be put in the public domain so that members of this House and those who rely um, on the services that are provided from RQA get the full picture not just from the board members who resigned, but also from the staff and the senior management team within the RQIA who were on the other side of, I suppose, what is now a public uh, debate. I hope today that I can bring some reassurance um, to those people who rely on RQIA, those people who are working in RQIA, that the department and me as minister are doing all that we can to make sure that those who rely on this service are getting the support that they need. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you. I'd be grateful if the Minister would correct me if I'm wrong in, in this summary of, of what I'm hearing in this session, which is that uh, the reduction of inspections was common to all neighbouring jurisdictions. 
that there was no systemic dismantling of the management of RQIA, uh, that the Minister has full confidence in the staff and executive management of the RQIA, uh, and that he anticipates that the new board will be more effective than the old one, pending uh, a departmental review of arm's length bodies. Um, I think the, the member has, has summarised uh, the full discussion um, that we have taken place in regards to the answer to this urgent oral question, um, because I do not think there is anything within what the member has said that anyone in this House could disagree with, because we do rely on RQIA providing a service uh, that reassures, reinforces and provides a comfort to those families who have loved ones currently residing in care homes. I call Paul Free. I welcome the Minister's presence here today to answer this question. Given the repurposing and the restrictions on inspections, what consideration was given to the adult safeguarding policies, particularly around risk assessment for individuals and the retention of information possibly required for criminal in investigations? And what alternative had been activated to ensure risk assessments uh, were undertaken? In regards to, to the repurposing of those individuals, it was necessary at that point in time. The member has asked quite a detailed uh, question there, which I'll get back to him in writing with a detailed answer. I could give him high-level briefing from what I have in my folder today, but I don't think it would do him or his question justice, because there is, a, I suppose, a, a greater need for the detail that he's asking that I would, prepare, I would rather provide him in written response than trying to answer it here verbally. And that is the end of our period of questions to the Minister on this oral, oral question. Uh, I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments until the uh, temporary speaker would take the chair. And the next item of business will be continuation of the education debate.